So when we're looking at leadership, we have um, a couple of quotes that show the extremes, the polarities between how we think about leadership. The first was um, Robert Nuslott, who said, uh, leadership is demonstrated when uh, the ability to inflict pain is con confirmed. Not the kind of guy I want to work for, but it, what he's saying is you have leadership when you have control. Okay. On the other side, you have Jimmy Wales saying, treat all workers as volunteers. And Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, essentially has to do that in, for, in order for uh, uh, Wikipedia to continue to thrive. So the question is, what is man uh, management? Here's the managerial chart. You have planning, leading, organizing, and controlling. And generally, the way that we think about this is planning is you create a plan, you define goals, you establish strategy, problem solve, it's top to bottom. Management plans and the workers work, right? We, we go and have the managers go into that back room and all the best and brightest minds go and do that. And then they come out and they direct and coordinate the work. They motivate workers to carry out the plan. They harness followers. Be motivated to carry out my plan. Right? And then we organize. And how do we organize? We determine what's to be done. Who's going to do it? We follow the organizational chart. It's a mechanistic model. We know who's supposed to be doing this. You're in charge of this function, and you're in charge of that function, and so you do that work. Whether you like that work or not, whether you are good at that work or not, doesn't matter. You're, that's your job. You're responsible for it. It's, it's clearly here in black and white. Okay? And then we control. And how do we control? We evaluate. We monitor activities. We ensure compliance, enforce the rules. Uh, we're involved in supervising, rewarding, and punishing to make sure it gets done. Controlling. That's the carrot or the stick. Sometimes we have rewards. Sometimes we have punishments. Now, this is what you're going to get when you look into most of the textbooks about what it says about how management is done, which is uh, kind of a crying shame because this is not how you should be doing it. But let's look at leadership, just a leading function. Here's directing, coordinating work, motivating workers to carry out the plan, harnessing followers. It's positional and by example, okay, that's leading. That's the kind of stuff that you'll find in these textbooks. In fact, I drew what you just saw out of these dozen textbooks. For my management class, I actually wrote my own textbook, and I compared all the, you know, the bold uh, definitions in each of the textbooks against each other to the, develop a more slim textbook, a, a more refined book that's clearer, because I'm convinced that some of these authors are paid by the word, okay? So, um, now, when we look at definitions of leading from the textbooks, we find things like this. Leading is a clear vision. It's energizing and enabling. It's organizing, uh, uh, enabling the organizational members. It's achieving organizational goals. That's leading. Okay, great. Um, it's to get members to do work together. It's motivating, directing, influencing people to work hard. It's motivating employees, directing the activities. Um, resolving conflicts, understanding people, uh, and being able to work well with them. Great. Motivating, directing, now you're starting to see some repeats here. Okay, so you're getting a sense of it. Now, a number of these definitions didn't even have a definition of leading. Uh, so we looked at what's the definition of leadership, which should be similar. Individual experts exert influence, inspires, motivates, directs activities. You're hearing the same kind of theme. Influence to influence, that's good. Right? Influence to shape goals, motivate behavior toward the goals. Uh, leadership is the process of directing behavior of others. Ability to influence employees, influence people to adhere to, dis to one's decisions. Now, stop there with what we just said. You're influencing them. You're kind of, you're, it's not control, but to do what? To adhere to one's decisions. Right? That going back to that planning part where you're, you're coming up with a plan and then you're, be motivated. Right? Uh, influence employees to pursue organizational goals, social influence process, and you, you're getting the idea. Some had no definitions for leadership. Now, the conclusion is that leadership is motivating, influencing, and directing. Is that fair? From what you just saw? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, good. But it's reduced to these things. There's far more to leadership than just that. So, if, if we um, look at the managerial chart here, the idea was that top managers plan, and then what do they do? They go motivate their workers to carry out their plan, right? And they organize for efficiency, and then they control to be sure that their plan is complete, right? Problem is, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work, and you probably have experienced it not working well. Have you ever had uh, in any organization that you've worked for in the past? Not necessarily where you are now. Um, but have you ever had uh, management come up with something and they say, hey, we're going to do this. And then you are looking at what they have just prescribed for you to do and going, what? <laughs> you ever experienced that? Like, 
if you had asked me, I could have told you this isn't going to work like this. They're convinced this is the best thing since sliced bread, but you know better, right? You've experienced that, right? Okay, why? Now, the problem has a lot of things embedded into it because of the way that you've gone about not leading from the start. You've gone about planning, you've gone about organizing, and you even have all the organizational controls in place, but you didn't start by leading. If you started with a leadership mindset, it would be very different. So here, you have inefficiency, miscommunication, demoralization, distrust, lack of ownership, lower productivity, absenteeism, higher turnover, workplace deviance. All of these are correlated to a lack of leadership. Okay, Why? Well, there's a reason. And I looked into the uh, academic literature for my answer because the textbooks by themselves are going to be somewhat lackluster with that. And so I looked at a bunch of uh, different uh, uh, leadership texts, uh, leadership articles, and according to the leadership literature, it's different. Common elements of leadership include things like motivation and influence. That's true. But it's not just that. It's also vision, relationship, change, emotional connection, leading by example, and many other attributes. These are just kind of the big rocks. This isn't the end all. Okay. Um, so let's go and look at a few of these. Motivation is a, it's in the, it's in the textbooks. Granted, it's core to leadership. Leadership is more than uh, it's, it's more about motivating and inspiring than controlling. And to their credit, some of the textbooks uh, definitions that you just saw talked about inspiring. Right? Talked about it. Inspiring them to do my work the way that I saw fit. Right? And inspiring them to do my plan. It's it's hard to inspire you to do my what I come up with. Does that make sense? Sounds more like manipulation to me. It is. In fact, the word management comes from the word manus, which means hand, like taking a horse by the hand. Right? It is. It, it, there's a something about the manipulation to it. That's a very good point. Okay? Influence. Who's that? Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow. Why is he one of the world's most 100, or 100 most influential people in the world? Can he make me do anything? I mean, he's a big guy. He probably could make me do something, right? But I mean, can, I mean, from where he is and wherever he's traded to this year, um, you know, he can't really make me do anything. But we follow him. Why? His popularity. And his popularity. His influence. He's he's different. He's somebody that people can aspire to be like, right? It, that's very different than control, right? My my boss, my dean, can make me do something, right? That's control. My the president of my organization. That's control. This is influence. It's a very different category. And to their credit, the textbooks understand motivation and influence. But it's beyond that. Influence is the increment above and over me mechanical compliance. So influence is higher than control. right? Uh, the true measure of leadership is influence. It's not about force. It's about persuasion. Persuasion to do my plan. Well, not exactly. See, that's where we miss it. That's where the disconnect comes in. Vision. Now, the texts don't generally talk about vision, or not nearly to the point that they need to. Who are these guys? Bill Gates, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Uh, did they have the same vision? No, they had very different visions, but are they both visionary? Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. Right? And one sees his product going and taking over the world, another sees his product taking over the world, and, and to some degree, both of them have helped in significant ways. Who, how many of you do not use Microsoft products? None. How many of you do not use Apple products? None. Isn't that fascinating? An iPad and a PC here. Yeah, in fact, yeah, that's right. I have an iPad and PC right here. That's, that's exactly right. Okay? Um, vision. A shared vision includes... Now, shared vision. That's important. The difference between my influence to do my plan as opposed to influencing you to accomplish a shared vision, or it's night and day. When we have a shared vision, what happens? Well, you have ownership in it, right? You have a stake in the process. You, you want to be involved in that, okay? It involves sense-making, setting direction, a clear purpose, a compelling future. Relationship, okay? Leadership is about relationship. It's better defined as a process or relationship. Relationship is a core ingredient of leadership. In fact, let's, let's talk about the, uh, the etymology here. Leadership. What's the suffix ship mean? Where else do you find the word ship? Ocean. No, no, the suffix. Oh. Just the, the, the end of the word. What other words can contain ship? Championship. Okay, which means a group of? Winners. Yeah, a group of winners, right? What other words? I'll give you a hint. Relationship, which means you're in relation to somebody else, right? Or friendship, that's two or more people that are friends. Right? 
So leadership means not just the leader and what the leader does, but the leader in relation to his followers, right? So until you get that in your head, that leadership is a relationship, you start looking at, well, what did the leader do? It doesn't matter just what the leader did. It's the relationship between the leader and the followers that's going to be the critical element. Does that make sense? Okay. Emotional connection. Now, this ties into relationship. An emotional a leadership is an emotional activity. We think about management, and, and they're in the back room planning. Remember, they're they're planning and huddling together the best and brightest minds back there, huddling together, planning things out. No, no, no. Leadership is an emotional connection. Do you want? Do you really want to follow a manager who is rational and purely rational to the point that he's going to kick you under the bus when you're too expensive to keep? Or do you want somebody that cares about your best interests and is trying to find a place where you can grow in the organization? You're going to follow the guy that cares about you. Okay? Where management is rational, leadership is emotional. And until you cross this divide and understanding this, you're not going to understand leadership. Leadership is inherently an emotional experience. Manage stuff. Manage your cars, your fleet of vehicles, your, your buildings. Lead people. Connect with people. Care about people. It's a very different experience. Mentors, for example, make emotional connections with their protégés. That's one of the reasons that they grow. Anyone, any idea who this is? Herb Kelleher. Does the name ring a bell? Southwest Airlines. Okay. He was a CEO of Southwest for a number of years. And his people took out this ad in, in, the, uh, in USA Today. said this, Thanks, Herb, for remembering every one of our names, for supporting the Ronald McDonald House, for helping load baggage on Thanksgiving. Now, let's stop there. Your CEO comes into work on Thanksgiving to help you with your work. And you're pretty low on the totem pole in the organization. You're not an executive vice president. You're loading baggage on the plane. What do you think of them? I like them. Do you like them? Yeah. Right. I mean, there's something to that. For giving each of us a kiss, and we mean everyone. For listening. For listening. What? It's a little different already. Okay? For running the only profitable major airline, for singing at our holiday party, for singing only once a year, for letting us wear shorts and sneakers to work, for golfing at the Love Classic uh, with only one club, for out-talking Sam Donaldson, for riding your Harley Davidson into Southwest headquarters, for being a friend, not, a not just a boss. Happy Bosses Day from each one of your 16,000 employees. Now, when 16,000 of your employees get together, pool their money so that you can take out a national ad to say thank you on Bosses Day, you're doing something right. You're leading well. You're making that emotional connection. Okay? Leadership is also about change. It's from moving from point A to point B. If you're not moving from one point to another, you're not leading. You're managing a, perhaps a very complex process, but you're not leading anywhere. Does that make sense? Okay? The purpose of change, uh, uh, sorry, the purpose of leadership is change. Managing is about coping with complexity. Leadership is about coping with change. Again, you have to be moving from one state to another state, from a, from a lower to a higher position, wherever you're trying to take the organization. Leadership by example. What do you grasp from this? He's obviously a leader. That's why he has to follow me on his... Uh... Follow me is the patch of the U.S. Army Infantry School. Right? Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Do you want to follow the general into battle who's sitting in the background? Hey guys, go up there and take that hill where all the, the shooting is. Yeah, if you're not willing to do it yourself, why would you ask other people? Mm -hmm. Or do you want the guy that's that is thinking, follow me? Follow me is a, a very potent metaphor for what leadership should be. Right? Mm -hmm. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to show you how to do it. Okay? Leading by example is a process of persuasion. It's modeling the way. Uh, those that, perform, uh, that set performance high for themselves earn credibility. There's something about the in the trenches effect. If, if, you know that you, if I know that you can do it, I'm more likely to emulate you. Right? Uh, leadership is uh, getting results uh, from exam uh, your example of empowering others. Servant leadership, what did, what did Christ do? Washing the disciples' feet and then say, go and do likewise. Okay? Go and do this as you've seen me do for you. Okay. Leading by example. A great a quote from uh, Captain Abershoff. A leader will never accomplish anything or accomplish what he or she wants by ordering it done. Real leadership must be done by example, not by precept. His book is great, by the way. If, you, if you're at all interested in reading his book, it's your ship. He gives an example, for example, of um, he's 
he takes over one of the worst ships in the Navy, makes it one of the best ships in the Navy, I mean, by the, all the scores, and the, the, the Benfold uh, went from just in the very last place to first place in their ship's category. And so when he got to the ship, for example, he saw the, um, the officers, uh, when it's time for, to eat, uh, the officers would just cut to the front of the line, get their food and go, and, and that was kind of standard procedure. And he walked over to the back of the line and stood there and waited his turn, and just waited his turn, and eventually one of the other officers came over and said, Captain, you can go right up to the front. He said, I know. Waited his turn, got his food, talked to his men. Next day, guess who got in line at the back of the line? I'm sorry, say again? All the officers. All the officers, why? Because he, Cause he was leading by example. Yep. What do you think that did to, to the crew's morale? They're right? One of us. Yeah, they're one of us. Another great example, Warren Bennis, uh, in one of his books, Warren Bennis is like a, the, one of the leading figures in uh, the leadership literature. Okay? Uh, he was talking about his experience in World War II, uh, you know, 20-year-old lieutenant, and he got assigned to uh, an outfit where he um, came in, and it was late at night, they were in, I don't know where they were, some, uh, remember the scene in uh, Saving Private Ryan, they're in a kind of you know, bombed out church and whatever, so it was that kind of scenario. And uh, one of the men said to him, uh, uh, sir, come over here, you can sleep on this, it was, you know, some kind of makeshift bed kind of thing that they put together. And he decided, no, I'm not gonna do that. And he slept on the floor in the middle of his men. In the morning, the platoon sergeant came along and said, who's the new guy? Oh, he's our lieutenant. He'll be good. Why? He's doing just like they did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes we think, well, rank has privileges. Well, what happens when you take those privileges? Just the same. I'm sorry? You're just the same. Yeah, no, what happens when you take the privileges instead of being just the same? Uh, Does it do something different? You, you're a different person than it. I mean, yep. I'm, I'm different. I'm the CEO, the captain, the what, whatever it is. It's sending a very negative message. In separation from your people. I'm sorry? The separation. That's right. So leading by example has a powerful effect. Other factors related to leadership include things like alignment, credibility, distributed leadership, empowerment, developing character, emotional intelligence, adaptive change, self-knowledge, authenticity, and the list goes on and on, but these are just some of the major ideas. Okay, so now we talked about the, the managerial chart. Okay, and in the managerial chart, uh, here again we see management is planning, leading, organizing, and controlling, and here we're creating this plan, and then we go and say, be motivated to do my plan, and then we organize people using the boxes on the organizational chart in order to carry out the plan, and then we control them by making sure they did my plan. Not always necessarily effective. So the question is, is there more to leadership than motivating, influencing, and directing? And uh, I think that if you look at this box, you think from what I just talked about that you can expand it. Is that fair? Something like that? Okay? It's a, it's a pretty big, it's a pretty significant difference. Okay? There's a lot to it that you can add uh, to what is leading. And now, how would a robust view of the way that we lead change the way that we do the other things? I mean, it, how, how would that change the way that we plan or control or uh, organize? And uh, so if we apply the leadership to all managerial processes, it would look something like this. Leadership over management, planning, leading, organizing, and controlling. And if we infuse that, instead of just compartmentalize influence and motivation and you know, using leadership as the, as the motor to get my plan done, if we just started with saying, okay, here's planning. Um, we can keep creating a plan, defining goals, establishing strategy, and problem solving. Let's get rid of this top to bottom stuff management plans and the workers do the work. Let's, let's get rid of it. Now let's set this aside. Just put it over on the side for now. And let's, um, <laughs> there's a great quote by Henry Ford where he says, uh, why is it that when, I, when I, I always get a whole person when what I really want is a pair of hands? That's that old school kind of mentality where, see, I've already created the plan. If they would just go and do what my plan, everything would work out fine, right? That's not what we want to do. Let's set this aside for now. And then let's add to planning, establishing a vision. Establishing purpose, compelling future, sense-making, setting direction, empowering others, and duplicating leaders. That is, we're going to involve duplicating leaders. We, the only way that we're going to empower and duplicate is if we involve other people from the start. Right? 
because we want them to grow in the leaders. There's a, a number of books like Happier and The Happiness Advantage where the findings essentially state that um, happy employees are more productive. Huh, go figure. If they actually like what they do, they thrive rather than they do this because it's part of the organizational chart and we told them what to do. Okay? There's a reason. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, right? God created, God's a creative God. He created you to have creativity, to, to be interested in certain things perhaps, and maybe not interested in others. Just, that's just the way that you're geared. So going back uh, here to the happiness advantage, if you are geared to be creative and you're told to carry out somebody else's plan, didn't have any involvement in the start, what do you think will happen? So here we have some um, implications. If you think through this, then you understand when Stephen Covey talks about how uh, in principle-centered leadership he says, I cannot influence you unless you're open to influence first. Right? So you as the manager, if you want to influence your people, you have to be open to hear their ideas. Hear what they have to say. If you're not, you're, they're just going to shut down and not do it. Okay, I'll do the minimum amount I need to do and then I'll check out. Okay? So the implications are planning should be an empowering process. Planning should involve others from the start. It should, you should consult with the team. You should use their ideas. In fact, if you're doing this right, it's not your ideas that you're coming up with. They will be bringing you ideas in the planning stage. Now, it's arguably sound to think that if a bunch of people bring you ideas, some of those ideas are going to be good, and you'll have better ideas overall than just a few of the best and brightest executive minds. Does that make sense? So you're, it's going to be a much more robust process. Let's, let's talk about uh, George Patton uh, said, never tell people how to do things, tell them what to do, and they will surprise you with their ingenuity. Huh. That's the kind of thinking that we should be doing. Okay, so um, we're not going to totally throw out what we already understand from the textbooks. We're still going to create a plan and define goals and establish strategy and problem solve, but we're going to do it by infusing that with people in the process. Does that make sense? Okay. In Good to Great, uh, Jim Collins talks about uh, leadership as a combination of fierce will and humility. That's what he calls a level five leader. In uh, the Leadership Challenge, Kuzis and Posner talk about how, you know, if I want trust, I have to extend trust to my people. And so leadership is going to be not just directing and coordinating work or motivating others to carry things out or even influence. It's going to, it's going to go beyond that. Okay? Um, this, we're going to kick out this harnessing followers and not rely on the position or the office. Okay? We, uh, I, I, you, know, uh, you can tell who's a bad manager by the, the number of times that they say, well, because I'm the manager, that's why. Right? Or I'm the parent. Or, or, right? Same thing. Okay? Now, we're going to keep the things that work. Influencing, persuading. Not coercing, but persuading and motivating. Now, there's a time where you need to have coercion. I, I get that. There's a time. But that should be as limited as possible in as few circumstances. And then we're going to add things like personal relationship, emotional connection, mentoring and modeling, servant leadership, authenticity, credibility. Right? When you add those kind of things, it's going to be a very different feel. Even leadership has expanded from what we started with. Okay? And the implications are that we now go beyond motivation. We're knowing ourselves. We're knowing our people. We're, uh, we're in an environment where we're emphasizing trust. And now, there's an interesting thing here. I have restraining yourself. Restraining yourself is an interesting thing. You know, sometimes we think, you ever thought, like, you know, if he wasn't a boss, I'd tell him a thing or two. You ever, ever been in that kind of situation? Who, who has not? Let me see. Show of hands. None. Right? So you've thought about that? You've thought about that? Right? Now, when you're a leader, you have to think in the same way. Because somehow when we think, well, when we're in charge, that, that um, you know, I can say whatever I want. You say whatever you want, that's the dumbest idea I ever heard. You're going to shut them down. You will never get a good idea out of that person again. You have just shot yourself in the foot. Right? So you have to restrain yourself as a leader and listen to those people and more than listen to them, respect and hear their ideas and, and not be the jerk that uh, jerk boss has been to you in the past. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's some implications here. The last one, growing leaders. Your purpose as a leader is to grow other leaders. Not to, have, not to accumulate as many followers as you can, but to grow other leaders. That's your goal. Okay? 
An institution is the length and shadow of one man. And that's true for even a department, right? It, I mean, it's going to be true on the larger scale with the CEO, but in your department, they're looking to you if you're the leader, okay? Now, this leads us to organizing, determining what is to be done and who's to do it, Organize, organizational charts, uh, a mechanistic model, job descriptions, chain of command, right? We have the chain of command on the wall and who's in what box, and there are job descriptions. Now, those job descriptions are helpful, but somebody wrote the job descriptions. Somebody could cross that line out and put something else. It's okay. You can, you can really do that. Right? Why is that important? Because people don't necessarily fit the box. If, somebody, if, if she's a whiz with math and you're not, and you're both in the same job description, you're going to hate life for the quantitative part of time, and you're going to love it for the quantitative, and maybe not for the other. Why don't we just move some of your work that's quantitative to her and some of her non-quantitative work, maybe she has to write reports, to you? That only makes sense, right? In the Eighth Habit, uh, Stephen Covey talks about finding your voice. That's what we're talking about, finding what it is that you do well. You're not, you're not supposed to do what you don't do well effectively. It just doesn't work that way. But we have chains of commands. And people, you know, and if you're the program and budget division guy, well, you better you know, do all the quantitative program and budget stuff and all the writing stuff equally well. But that, we're human. We don't function that way necessarily. Okay, so let's strike out a few things in organi organizing. Let's keep determining what is to be done and how to do it. We can even keep organizational charts, but let's strike out this mechanistic model, the job descriptions, the chain of command, in the sense of that we rely on that thoroughly, as opposed to looking at um, other things. In Good to Great, for example, uh, Collins talks about getting the right people on the bus. Not even necessarily, and getting them into the right seat on the bus, right? Now, if you apply that kind of thinking, then you're going to add other things to this list, not just the organizational chart, but distributed leadership, that is, that there's leaders at different levels in the organization. You're going to look at duplicating leaders, trying to create more. You're going to look at um, uh, utilizing emotional intelligence, their strengths and weaknesses, where they are, how they fit, right? Getting the right people to do the right things. Not, and that's not necessarily what's in the box. You can, you can change the job description, okay? Enjoy at work, Dennis Bach talks about how uh, the key to success is not treating everyone equally. It's treating everyone differently. Now, that sounds weird, but we kind of go, what? What were you going to say? It makes sense. It makes sense. Why does it make sense? Because everyone's different. Because everyone is different. So if you treat everyone equally, we'll, I, I know in society we want to treat everyone fairly. I get that. But if you treat all your employees the same, they're not going to be able to react the same because they are different. Personal. It's a personal approach. It's right. This week, two of my kids learned to ride a bike without training wheels. Okay? The older one did it. And the older one, if I want her to do something, I have to kind of provoke her a little bit. Right? No, I, I can't take the training wheels. You can't do it. Yes, I can. Right? No, you can't. And then she's going to be stubbornly, you know, doggedly, she's going to ride the bike because she's going to show me that she can do it. She started doing it. And within a day or two, she was singing, ride like the wind. Right? Riding around the circle in our cul-de-sac. Now the second one, um, that's not his personality. If I say, you can't do it, you don't think I can do it? Right? I, I took the training with, he asked if he could do it too. And I said, I think you're ready. And then I had to praise him along the way. You're doing a good job, buddy. As he's, <laughs> right? Come on, you can do it. You think I can do it? Different personalities. They just are different. And if you want to get effectiveness out of people, you've got to realize where they're different. This is why it's so foolish when somebody comes into a, a new organization and you go, aha, I'm coming in and here's my plan. You don't know any of the people. Your plan may not work with this set of people. Right? So you have to understand that people are different. Now, the implications are that we go beyond efficiency. We're removing obstacles. That's the point of organization. We're investing in people as people. We're treating each of our people differently. It's an organic process. Peter Drucker was asked once, are leaders born or made? And he said, neither. They're grown. Isn't that interesting? They're grown. It's an organic process. It's, I mean, you go from one experience to another, and you grow and grow over time. That's right. It's an organic process. And you're organizing in order to grow leaders. That's what you're trying to do. You're not organizing to have the chart there so that it's efficient, but you're trying to grow leaders because you're looking not just at bottom line efficiency now, but long-term health of the organization. That's a very different picture than the way that we normally think about it. Hug your people. 
uh, in, in this book, Jack Mitchell talks about uh, associates at his uh, stores in New York City. It's a clothier, uh, uh, clothing stores. Uh, and in his stores, they call everyone an associate. Now, Walmart calls people associates too, right? But the difference is that he really means it when he calls them associates. He respects them as associates. He deals with them as associates. He talks about checking in, not checking up. There's a difference between checking in on someone. Hey, how can I help you? Is everything all right? Is, there's a difference between that and did you get the TPS reports done? Right? There's a, I mean, there's just a, a completely different mindset. And again, it's, it's what you do with it. Is it real? Is it legitimate? Is it what you really mean about caring about them? Or is it something where you're just kind of saying it? Okay? You can tell the difference. So controlling. Controlling is about evaluating, monitoring, ensuring uh, compliance, enforcing rules, supervising, rewarding, and punishing. Can you see already how this is going to change? What do you think? How is this going to change? Instead of enforcing the rule, we'll be uh, helping out or kind of, uh, well, I wouldn't want to say supervisory, but. What were you going to say? Um, I guess the structure would change uh -huh. because you wouldn't have, you'd have to know that you're people uh -huh. and then figure out where they're going to fit into it. Right, because once you actually know good. them, then it's going to be different in how you evaluate. That's a good part. What else? Be like enforcing rules, it's getting more buy in. That's right. If you got buy in on the front end because they were in the planning process, part of the decision making, then it's going to be so much easier to control as opposed to making sure. Now, again, this doesn't work in every area. I mean, if you're in a manufacturing kind of environment where you're just trying to get uh, produce the, the exact same part every time as opposed to a more creative environment, it'll change. But the same idea will work. There are people in manufacturing environments that have all kinds of great ideas that if you were just open to hearing it in the planning stages, it would be a, a, a uh, all kinds of great ideas would flow. Okay. In the third habit, um, Stephen Covey talks about how you know we have the wrong paradigm. We talk about people like they're a cog. They're not a cog. How many how many people are yes I'm a cog in a machine. I will go to work and be worn out. <laughs> right? That's that's not what we're about. You're not a cog in a machine, okay? So controlling, let's set this aside here for now. And again, go back to hug your people. Um, Jack Mitchell talked about how, you know, really what you want to do is have expectations, not rules and regulations. There's a big difference between having expectations, this is what I expect that will be happening, as opposed to set rules that, that bind every circumstance. Why do you set all these rules that, uh, you know, deal with every circumstance? Because you're trying to dummy-proof it. Right? This is what you do at McDonald's. There's a rule for this and a rule for that, and make sure you flip your hamburger at this point. And, right? That's different than having expectations of excellence, of what you expect your associates to be doing. Right? Because you really believe that they're associates. Okay? So here, controlling is about vision, relationship, motivation, credibility, mentoring and modeling, leading by example. Are those different than what you saw before? They're going to be different in a significant way, right? When leadership is infused, now vision is going to be, and motivation is going to be doing a lot of the controlling for you, right? If you got involved in the planning stages early on, that's going to take care of itself. In the happiness advantage, um, we find that uh, uh, how you deal with your, your subordinates is very important. In fact, there is a 30% uh, more likely to have, a, an employee is 30% more likely to have coronary heart disease if he works for a bad boss. How do you like that? That's the equivalent of eating bad food, like eating greasy food as your diet, having a bad boss. The, when you are managing other people to that person, you are more powerful or have more of a daily effect on that person than the CEO of the organization. Right? And so that relationship is going to be relationship. Remember that? It's going to be very important. Okay, so controlling is going to include some of these things, like monitoring, ensuring compliance. But it's going to, when you're ensuring compliance in this scenario, it's going to be a very different type of ensuring of compliance. It's, I mean, I, I'm maybe checking in with rather than checking up on. Okay, because you're in an environment of trust, relationship, vision, ownership, preventative control, 
And, and then I have here being in command, not in control. And I borrowed that from a Marine Corps general that talked about how he does what he does. When I send my troops into the field, I'm in command. Yes, you need to take that hill. But my officer at the lowest level, and, you know, the platoon that's going to go take that hill, is actually in control. Okay, sir, uh, I'm not going to take a frontal assault. I'm going to go around the side, or uh, that we're going to have a pincer movement, or whatever it is. Does, does that make sense? He's in control at the lowest level. You push that authority down. But he's, the Marine Corps general is still in command. Yes, we need to take that hill. Unless there's just absolutely no way that, you know, maybe we need to do something different. But you're in control of what's going on operationally, day -to, you know, on a day-to-day -day kind of basis. Okay? Machiavelli asked, uh, it was, is it better to be loved or feared? And his advice was, it's better to, uh, better to be loved more than feared. Uh, I'm sorry, from this arises the question whether it is better to be loved more than feared or feared more than loved. And his advice was that it's much safer to be feared than loved if one has to be wanting. What do you think? You want to work for Machiavelli? But don't a lot of our managers in business think that way? It's unfortunate. They start in all the wrong places. Okay, so you have a choice. We have the old managerial chart where leadership is compartmentalized as it is here or you have what I just laid out for you. And again, in this old one, top managers plan and they say, be motivated to carry out my plan. Right? Works really well. And then they organize for efficiency and then they control to see that their plan is completed their way and they have all those maladaptive behaviors. Or you can do it a different way and actually start with leadership from the front. And when you start with leadership at the start, you emphasize vision, you involve others from the start, you go beyond motivation here and how you lead, you lead your people, and you go beyond efficiency and you organize to their strengths, and it's a, you control with trust, you control with the relationship, you control with vision and ownership. It's a different way. It's just a different path. And if you start with leadership, it comes, uh, it, it provides different, um, when you start with leadership here, you're going to, come to a very different conclusion here. 